Well, welcome to West End Resilience Live. Today, we welcome the Retail Minister, who's also the Minister for London, Paul Scully MP. The Minister will be giving an update on the government's position on reopening, his thoughts on the future of retail and answering your questions. After his thoughts, we'll have a question and answer session with Paul and you can put your questions to him by clicking, as always, on the question mark icon at the bottom of your webinar window. But first, let's cross over to Jace Tyrrell, Chief Executive of New West End Company. Jace. Thank you, Martin, and good afternoon, West Enders, members, partners and friends of the West End. It's great to have you back with us uh, this afternoon for West End Resilience Live. So we now have a date uh, following the Prime Minister's address on Monday evening for the 15th of June that we can start to open up non-essential retail in the UK. And of course, a key part of our streets, Bond Street, Oxford Street and Regent Street. Uh, so I'm delighted today that we have a view from the government to help us understand uh, what that means to reopening and also as we move into the recovery stages. All the way along this journey, we've been here to support you, our members and partners. And as we start to reopen, we'll be issuing updated guidance uh, around how we can open safely and sustainably in the West End, both for our colleagues returning to work, but also our customers who will be coming back to the West End in the weeks and months ahead. And really three key areas that we're focused on. Firstly, is that safety aspect and making sure particularly we think about the public realm and the transport in the West End. Second is around extra hygiene, which we're going to have a whole increase of measures to really help with the safety and hygiene aspects of the West End. And third is around standards, standards of trading and operations to make sure that we can be COVID secure as we come into this reopening phase. So really delighted that we have the minister with us today. As Martin says, it is our minister for two areas, uh, which are very important to the West End, obviously London as a great global capital city and also the all important retail sector, which of course is a big part of the rest of West End's ecology. I'm sure the minister will know that one in five jobs in London work in retail, hospitality, leisure and culture. So a very important part, uh, particularly with jobs and the economy as we start to move in the recovery phase. So I want to thank the minister for giving us the time to join us today and hand over to him to take some uh, questions and some opening remarks. Minister, over to you. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you, Jace. It's a pleasure to, to join you today. Um, you know, we, COVID-19 has had a profound income, uh, incoming impact on our society right the way across this country, but especially in the West End. And it's when I um, uh, spoke to Jace very early on in the situation when he was talking about the impact of tourism uh, stopping and slowing down in London right the way through to where we are now with lockdown and that, that effective slogan of keep home, stay home, save lives, protect the NHS. Uh, we've got to start to unlock that now in terms of giving people a sense of confidence of not just employers, of those retailers and other businesses that Jason was talking about, the employees as well to feel safe to come back to home, but those customers to actually get out there now and start to use uh, what is on their doorstep, the retail, the other areas, as we start to open up the economy. The, that's such an important economy uh, in the West End that, that is really vital for the whole of the country. And so that's why we recognise the role of the West End in convening and supplying all of these businesses. And that's why we want to make sure that the uh, West End um, representatives are right at the heart of the conversation about how we get back to work. It's a fantastic international city that we live in. And West End, it really does encapsulate all of that in retail, in hospitality. And that's it basically is why people want to come to the UK. And so we need to make sure that we are showcasing our creativity through that confidence. And the openness of the city and the attract, uh, the uh, ability to attract the best and the brightest isn't mustn't be diminished by this situation. And that's why the date that Jace was talking about, the 15th of June, assuming the um, health advice and the scientific guidance stays the same, is an important symbolic moment to give businesses the certainty to have something to aim for now. Because what retail have told me, what the hospitality sector has told me, well, clearly hospitality will come later, is that they want notice. They want as much certainty as we can. The best way of giving certainty is to make sure that you are there at the heart of the conversation, at the heart of formulating that guidance, because then there'll be few, if any, surprises for you. And so in order to 
um, develop the guidelines that enable us to open. We'd already had a set of work, the safer workplace guidance, which for the businesses that hadn't had to close the food retail and other areas, we looked at work specific um, uh, environments such as factories, warehouses, but also shops, working in cars, working in uh, people's homes and these kind of things. And we've taken that learning and that is helping us feed in uh, to our new work streams, the, the task forces, uh, which cover a number of areas, two of which being led by my department in Bayes. And the, the two that we're leading on is the non-essential retail, which as we've heard, we're aiming for a, um, a largely 15th of June uh, start, but some will start um, opening uh, um, uh, as best we can earlier, but uh, um, and, and hospitality as well, which will come later. And that is being dealt, uh, dealt with and worked up with businesses, with business representative organisations and also the trade unions as well. We want to have as many as much feedback as we can um, in making sure that we can bring that confidence back to the West End and the, and the country as a whole. So the retail sector has been undergoing a significant transformation in recent months and that's been accelerated during this pandemic. There's been a number of conversations that have been accelerated this pandemic, good and bad. So if you look at the high street uh, and, and, and indeed the West End retail, these are things that we were looking at. What does retail, what is retail going to look like in five, ten years time? Frankly, we need to be looking at what it's going to look like in one year's time, two years time, because what would be sensible is to actually have one single movement, smooth movement, if we can, diagonally, rather than trying to get back to where we were in January and then find that we're having to shift across to the new reality anyway. So that's the conversation we need to start having pretty quickly after businesses start to open next month as well. But on the other hand, the flexibility of working, working from home on um, uh, using software like this and digital take up. The acceleration of that take up has allowed for um, increase in flexible working. And as the Minister for, um, for uh, Labour Markets, one of the big things I will be doing in, when we get back to business as close to usual as possible is putting through the Employment Act, which allows for um, flexible working to be the default option. But clearly for retail, um, people will want to still touch uh, their goods, go and visit uh, their shops and making sure we need to make sure that the footfall on the high streets in the West End uh, is up as high as possible. So effectively, we want to make sure that we're listening to you, that we're taking your feedback, we're feeding it into that guidance. So you are helping shape that guidance. So I'll leave it there. I will want to listen to your questions. I want to answer them as best as possible. Take the feedback away as well to help make sure that we can go through the gears uh, of our economy so that we can motor once again. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, uh, Paul. We do need your questions. Uh, do just click on the little icon at the bottom of your screen. It's a question mark icon and you just need to type in your question there and then you can put those questions, all those questions that you have to Paul. So if you can uh, just uh, click away and type away and put your questions to him. Um, you, you talked about a number of things there, Paul, but I, I wonder one of the big challenges that we're going to, I think, face is people feeling unsafe and how do you think uh, organisations uh, uh, like uh, the West End Company can help uh, to get people uh, to feel safe when they come to the West End? Yes, yeah, so we've talked about the, um, the simplicity but effectiveness of that message, stay at home, save lives. And what's happened over that period of time, to, in my mind, is that people have moved away from the original premise of social uh, distancing, which was to protect the most vulnerable and people feeling uh, if, uh, healthy people in fear of their own life, which statistically really isn't the case. And so that's why we shifted towards talking about staying alert taking sensible precautions, common sense. And so it's incumbent on all of us now um, to make sure that we can encourage everybody to do that. But where the uh, the new West End company and all the relevant organisations within can, can, can help is to make sure that first of all, they're putting the, they're shaping the, the, the guidelines so that the economy, the economics of opening works with the health uh, reasoning behind it all. Um, but also to show and demonstrate to their employees and importantly their customers 
look, we have put everything in place for you that the government's asking, that everybody sensibly uh, is asking for. There are risk assessments here. Um, and the more independent voices that we can actually have saying that, I think the better. Then people will start gradually, not, not overnight, but will gradually start to come once again. That there is a wider piece, clearly, because people do need to feel safe on transport, on public transport, uh, and getting into and out of London as well. And so that's part of a wider piece that we're dealing with, with um, not only the new West End company, with organisations around London. OK, there's a question here from Paul. You rightly say the West End is so important to the economies of London and the wider UK, but so much of the West End depends on international visitors who are not likely to return until the start of 2021. How can we keep the government's vital business support measures going after October, especially furlong for those businesses that depend on their incomes on international visitors? Yeah, thank you very much. I think I, I think I got the question. It broke up a, a slightly, but you're talking about the financial support. What we've tried to do is to keep uh, our fi financial support flexible. So if you go back to the Chancellor's um, original budget when he announced £330 billion worth of measures, it was seen as a very big, grand exercise and very flexible at the time, very generous and flexible at the time. But boy, have we had to become even more flexible and even more generous. Uh, as things have developed and, and, and we needed to make sure that the loan scheme worked better, so which is why things like the bounce back loans started to come into place. We've had to change the grant scheme and introduce a level of discretion as well because there were businesses falling between the cracks. So we've always tried to be responsive. The furlough scheme that you mentioned, Martin, the, um, the job retention scheme, as you say, we've extended it through to October, but what we've also done is to allow it to, uh, to flex in itself. So allowing part time uh, work because we know that businesses are not going to go back to as they were in day one. They're going to gradually need people to do um, more and more work. And so we need to keep listening and responding to, uh, um, to, to, to businesses, especially as you say, ones that are uh, dependent on the international uh, visitors. Question here from Steve. Does the minister understand that the void in communication from the previous announcement to the one on Monday evening has meant that the majority of us had been planning to a or for a date of the June the 1st and find out with only six days notice that the date is actually going to be the 15th has meant that we have wasted a lot of time and effort in our reopening planning process. That's from Steve. Well, I'm sorry to hear that's the case. I hope that planning won't actually be wasted because clearly it's um, it, it's going to be needed in the lead up. But I appreciate the times have changed. What we've tried to do is we've tried to use uh, get the balance right between the health advice and the economic imperative. The government's first priority has to be to save lives, but restoring livelihoods, protecting businesses uh, is absolutely uh, imperative as well because the ongoing issues over many many years if we get that wrong will be will be significant so as I say, I'm sorry that on 1st of June there will be open markets and a few other things open but but he's right on the 15th of June we can hopefully as long as the health situation doesn't deteriorate we will be able to aim with some certainty at opening that non-essential retail. A really interesting point here International tourists, why would they return to the West End with a 14 day quarantine and fears over travelling um, in place? Well, I think the point is with this um, th is that uh, with, with regard to quarantine, when people weren't travelling before, it wasn't necessarily um, the uh, uh, as, as um, much of an impetus to, to, to put into a, a quarantine. But now if we're getting our R rate down and there's some suggestion that uh, London is a lower R rate than uh, some other parts of the country, the work, last thing we want to do is have a second wave. If you think about the five tests that the government have been talking about throughout, that having a second wave will be economically terrible for London, frankly. And so, um, as I say, the first priority has to be save lives, has to be based on that health advice. I appreciate that's difficult. We're also then looking at um, uh, introducing test and trace system uh, soon, and that is the thing that's actually going to be allow uh, allow the 60 million people of this country to have their freedom. That's the one that's by by 
um, making sure that uh, if we are brushing past people over, well, brushing past, if we are spending any length of time with people next to people with COVID-like symptoms, um, then we would have to socially isolate. It allows the uh, the majority of people to get out there and start opening up the economy. But I do appreciate the fact that international travellers are going to take time to come back to the UK, as they have across the world in other markets as well. But what if those people are coming on a plane from somewhere which has a lower R rate than the rest of the UK? Wouldn't there be some sense in saying, look, this is a country which has a negligible negligible problem with COVID-19, in fact, less of a problem than there is across the rest of the UK. Therefore, we're not going to have a problem letting those people come in without the 14 day quarantine. Yeah, well, this is all things that we'll actually take in advice as as um, countries around the world are gradually opening up. We look, we are clearly looking at what other countries are doing, both in terms of retail, but also in this case, in terms of travel. Um, and so we'll we'll what we don't want to do, as I say, is to see what has happened in certain countries, including China, uh, whereas they've had uh, the second wave has been imported in many ways. But I appreciate what you say, Martin. And that's why with all of these things, it's difficult when we're as far as government concerned, we are working in real time. I mean, uh, what, what for those of us that have been in the private sector before a political life, um, you know, this might seem relatively slow. Uh, when we're talking about the planning uh, from the retailer that we heard earlier. But actually, de dealing with things in a matter of days and weeks uh, for government is normally months and years. So this is real time as government gets, but we retain the need to be flexible. So we will learn from other countries and see what's going on with that R rate and how we might change the rules. Um, question here from someone who's anonymous. Um, is it expected to have all retailers opening at the same time or are you aware of a staggered approach uh, as from the 15th instead? I'm not aware of a, of, of a stagger. I suspect re diff re different retailers will take the um, decision themselves to open at different times. What we're working up on now in London, though, is the plan of how we open up the, uh, the, the transport system more fully. Um, and as, as, as we, um, um, you know, the more and more people coming in and out of London. And I think the sensible thing there would be for people to stagger their journeys. Uh, that's always been the case that people could travel. It's never been um, uh, the case that only key workers could travel using public transport. But I've always talked to people about the fact that do you need to travel during rush hour? Because then if people can feel comfortable socially distancing, then they're more likely to use public transport. They're more likely to come and vi um, visit the shops as 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 they open. But it would make sense to uh, to work with neighbours uh, because social you can socially distance and put all measures in your store. But obviously, out on the streets themselves, you need to have measures. It's all very well at the moment when we only have the to, on the main have the supermarkets open. You can have a, a queue going down the street if you've got half a dozen shops all next to each other then what do you do with those cues? These are all things that we need to work out. OK, question here from Simon Thomas, who's uh, from the Hippodrome. To continue with the current levels of social distancing is not sustainable. We have great hopes of a vaccine, but there's no certainty. And indeed, SARS was 17 years ago, and despite a lot of trying, there was no vaccine. What is the plan B and how soon could it start? I'm guessing what he's getting at there is the whole track and trace uh, as as a, a an alternative or to maybe to work in tandem with with social distancing. Yeah, well, there, there will be an announcement very, very soon uh, on test and trace. And uh, what that's essentially going to be is, um, is is an app uh, that uh, will um, uh, will gradually move towards an app that we've been testing uh, and which will alert you if you have been uh, next to someone for a um, uh, significant, medically significant period of time uh, that will then require you to so socially isolate. And that's what I was saying about earlier, which will give you the, uh, give other people the freedom to actually be, to be uh, allowed to get out of the more restrictive uh, lockdown. So in the meantime, as I say, test and trace will be there. The vaccine um, uh, research is going at, at a pace and he's, he's right to say that none of this has been done before in terms of finding a vaccine that quickly. So it is a matter of implementing social distancing, 
making sure that the workplaces are COVID-19 secure, that we can get the test and trace right, uh, but just make no mistake, socially distancing and all of this, the fight against the virus is going to be with us for months um, and, and some considerable time. This isn't going to be something we're going to be able to switch off um, and, and win uh, immediately, unfortunately. One of the things which I observed when I was looking at, at, at a programme which was talking about the whole um, need for tr to track and test, test and trace, the challenge is, is if you've got somebody working in a shop, you could have somebody that is infected just walking past them and they might be behind a screen uh, and doing all the things to protect themselves from getting infected, but the app could trigger off an alarm. Is there going to be enough people, foot soldiers if you like, on the ground to make sure that those people aren't getting warnings and alerts unnecessarily um, because they just work in a shop and, and there are going to be a lot of people walking past them that might trigger off alarms. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the, as I say, you'll see the detail as it's announced, but yes, this, this is the, the, the point that we've been uh, making sure that the safer workplace guidance that we are working on uh, as a department and as a group of businesses and business representative organisations and unions are working with the test and trace uh, regime as it comes in to avoid the, uh, the the false reports and especially if you are socially um, either socially distancing or making sure that you've got all the protections with either PPE or perspex screens or whatever that they don't register as a, a, as a, um, a contact if you like the contact has to be something that uh, you know may well give you uh, uh, transmit the disease rather rather than have, being too close to someone but with all full protection in front in, in between you. Um, question here from Mark. Hi Paul, I manage stores in the beauty industry offering services to customers. It's indicated that beauty services will be allowed to start operating from around the 4th of July. Uh, planning to be able to do this safely is paramount. When do you see the government will be publishing guidelines and what your expectations are for us to trade safely? Well, as you can see, I've got lockdown hair, so I'm pretty desperate for that to happen as well. Um, but the uh, uh, one of the work streams, as I say, is actually about working in close proximity. So we've been having conversations at the back end of last week, working up guidance for uh, beauticians, for hairdressers, for nail bars and all, uh, and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All of the people that are sitting next to someone, standing next to someone as, as they are working to make sure that we can get that guidance um, up and running. We are working at a pace, an incredible pace, and there's a lot of people putting amazing work into, not, not just the government, but as I say, that are working in those fields. So I, I'm, that, that will be with us very, very soon. OK, thank you. There's a message or a question here, I should say, from Carlos. How can we speed up temporary licensing changes to support the reopening? The normal process takes too many weeks. Can we have emergency measures so we can survive when we reopen or when we open? Well, certainly what we'll do is uh, to we're trying to reduce as much regulation and ease regulation as best we can. Um, so if you let me know, work with the new West End company to let me know of any easements that you want in particular, more than happy to take them, consider them, work up, work up with both with Westminster Council, but also MHCLG if there's a government block there as well. We want to be adaptive. We want to make sure that we can flex as best we can. Clearly, the regulations are usually there for a reason. There's two sides to the story, so we can't just say, OK, well, let's just throw away the rule book. But nonetheless, the point is we want to work with businesses to make it as easy as possible to get back to that new normal, whatever that new normal is. OK, there's another question here from someone who's anonymous. Um, one of the main issues facing the retail market even before COVID-19 is business rates and the outdated system. This has ultimately meant that many retail stores have become unviable and landlords are now stuck with huge unrecoverable costs. The government's rates holiday for tenants has definitely helped for the for short term, but this needs to be backed up by a more longer term sustainable solution to help the retail market and the high street recover. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, you, you know, we've uh, put in place, as you say, the uh, the business rates holiday and um, we've talked about the fact that the business rate revaluation that was um, aimed to be happening 
uh, in the months to come won't happen now. Um, and so uh, in terms of where we go with business rates, we've always talked about the fact as a government, as this government, that we that we want to review business rates to make sure there's something more effective that, that, than something that's uh, not necessarily uh, fit for a modern age. So we will make sure that we uh, that, that we continue to uh, have that review. Another anonymous questioner here. Um, what steps will be taken with TfL regarding tube stations and the bottleneck of customer traffic using them in areas such as Oxford Circus? How will you enforce it as a safe way to travel? Well, as I say, this is these conversations are going on. There was one uh, earlier on which I need to catch up on because I wasn't able to make it myself. Um, so as well as working through the just the wider top level piece, we have working groups that are coming up with signage, that are coming up with the one way systems. It is going to be a challenge. Clearly, you 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 know only too well how many people pass through Oxford Circus at any one given time, and that is going to be a challenge. But that 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 means a lot of flexibility, not just from t transport for London, but for people with their usual, um, their previous usual uh, travel habits. We're going to have to uh, uh, compromise for for some time to come. But um, Transport for London are working up those and uh, I'll, I'll uh, make sure that I'm catching up with the, the latest uh, when I get back after this meeting, which is, as I say, their meeting finished half an hour ago. OK, um, a question here, related question, Paul, but it, it might uh, bring up a, a separate thought from you. So I'll put it to you. It's from Anna. How can we increase the transport provision with the tube running at 15 percent capacity? Our employees and customers can't get into the West End. Yeah, well, we've got to um, we've got to increase it to 100 percent. Now, clearly, that um, the 100 percent in terms of capacity, there won't be 100 percent of people coming through it for the reasons that I've just said. You've got to socially distance on it, but you're far easier to socially distance if you've got more trains coming through. Um, so in the morning, I typically I've been up to Parliament a few times and when I have, I've typically come in um, through Hammersmith. Um, just the vagaries of my my travel at the moment and that part of the district line it's been really easy to social distance but actually uh, from the other side of the social di uh, district line coming from Barking it is already still um, snarling up and it's becoming more of a challenge the more trains the easier it's going to be but as I say even then we're still going to have to compromise we're going to have to stagger our journeys and, and take protection this is why face coverings at the moment aren't mandatory but they they, they may well give you confidence uh, in, in terms of traveling, in terms of being able to socially distance. OK, there's a question here again from an anonymous questioner, but what are the government doing about banks not processing bounce back loans? HSBC in particular, they say, is taking two weeks plus to process. And I, I know this from anecdotally having conversations with uh, with other friends that uh, run small businesses that, that they say that some banks aren't giving these? I mean, my understanding is that the, all the banks should be doing this because they're being unwritten, underwritten by the government. Is, is that your understanding? Well, there are also issues around some, some of the loans. I mean, the bounce back loans are by far the simplest and were introduced to cut through exactly uh, the uh, situation that you're describing. So it's disappointing to find out that there are still examples, but um, you don't have to stick to your own bank. So if you are struggling or if the bank doesn't want to uh, lend money because they're not obliged to, uh, although, as you say, it's made easier for them because they're 100 percent guaranteed by the banks, uh, by the government. Uh, there is no interest um, the repayments for the first 12 months. They are um, capped at two and a half percent. So the so making it as affordable and as easy as possible. But you can go to another accredited bounce bank lend lender um, and the only extra thing that you'll have to do if it's not your own bank is to go through a, a the anti-money laundering, the, the know your client check. So shouldn't be too onerous, but it is an extra check that you wouldn't have to go through if it was your own bank. I'd be interested to know examples though, um, and especially as you say, you talk about HSBC, if there are clusters, or if there are particular banks that are blockages, we have regular conversations with the banks and with UK finance that, that oversee them, that work with them. Uh, as well to see what more we can do to break down those barriers and make sure the banks are doing what they are charged to do and that's lend money to give cash flow certainty uh, now not in a few months time when it's too late. Okay question here from Eva how do you think luxury retailing which is based on personal interaction with the customer can be executed along the two meter social distancing rules are there any plans for this distance to be reviewed? 
Well, it's interesting that you talk about that with luxury shopping, because actually one thing that I have had in terms of the two metre rule uh, is a lot of representation from hospitality sector about it. Um, in my regular conversations with them and as part of this task force, this return to work task force for hospitality, they were crying out for the fact that I think the example they, they gave us was that if you are um, using two metres, you could probably open up 30% of a pub or restaurant, um, one and a half metres as they do in some countries, it would be 50%, one metre might be 70%. So uh, so they are looking at it from, uh, as, as, as your questionnaire is there, from an economic point of view. We've got to make sure we're balancing that with the uh, advice from the scientific experts and about the impact with um, how long you can be close to somebody or within two metres of somebody uh, compared to the really short, a lot shorter time that you uh, can be next to someone one meters, and so it's a, it's a, it's a really difficult health versus economy um, point of view, which we are um, tackling. We are listening. We're trying to work through at the moment, but it's a point that has been made. Um, another anonymous questioner here: London and the West End compete on a global stage. How can the government help maintain London's place in the world? So before I was um, uh, a business minister, Minister for London, I was a trade envoy. I was the prime minister's trade envoy for Thailand, Brunei, and Burma. And what I saw there was a real thirst for British brands, for British expertise, for British creativity, um, and also investment in the UK as well. So in Bayes now that we've um, had Lord Grimston, the uh, uh, former banker that's been appointed as a joint minister for both Bayes and the develop, uh, Department for International Trade. And his job is to um, drive in, um, international investment into the UK. And so that will be um, from the showcasing that we're talking about, the confidence that we're talking about to make sure that people understand that the West End is still there uh, in, in the city that is probably the best city in the world to work, to live, to bring up a family, to educate your family and to frankly go out and have a great time. Um, question here from Lee, returning to a question that uh, we put before, but I, I think it's a really interesting point and I know that it's a point that many people are uh, have on their minds. His question is this, the answer to the quarantine question is so far out of alignment with European countries. How does our scientific advice differ so much, especially after allowing multiple flights to arrive during the peak? Well, I think during the peak, a lot of, a lot of the flights were British returnees. Um, and so with uh, relatively small, a lot smaller numbers than the, which we'll be talking about in the future. So that's why the government's taken the view um, you know, that this is the, 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 the point in time to introduce the quarantine measures. But as I said before, we will make sure that we're, we're reflecting on that, continue to reflect on that with international comparisons as, uh, as well. But those people that were coming back at that time could have been coming back from highly infected areas and be bringing in the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease with them. I mean, there is a sense, I think, amongst many people that this whole quarantine policy is one which is shutting gates and, and doors after the horse has bolted. Yeah, well, as I say, I think just, you know, looking forward, we've got to make sure that we, we are now talking about a, a lot, a lot more significant numbers. And uh, when you're talking about the situation that we're going to be in in terms of test and trace and more people away from their homes, you've moved from that um, uh, contain phase, you move from that people when when people yeah, they might have, if they had been coming back from uh, whichever areas, they would have still largely been at home. Now there's going to be less compulsion to to come at home, but, they, but they've but they got to be picked up with that test and trace. So I think it's a, it's an insurance policy in many ways um, to, to, to uh, um, that, that as people are going about their business a little bit more freely, um, the people that are coming back that potentially could be bringing a second wave with them are, are, are not going to be doing that. Question here from David. Uh, with retail and hospitality in the West End so dependent on cultural attractions, theatres, museums, etc., what across government work are BIS doing along with the Department of Culture, Media and Sport to coordinate an approach? 
So we work closely together, but it's a really, really good point because uh, you're right. If you look, you know, we talk about hospitality. If you look at the hotel industry, for example, now, if you are a hotel on the south coast of England, then clearly you've got the sea. And so uh, you can people will go to that hotel to go to the beach or whatever. But if you're in the middle of London, typically, if you're in a hotel, you, you want to go to a hotel. You want to go because you want to enjoy the theatres. You want to go to the cinemas, the restaurants and all, all these other things and then stay over the night. So they are totally interlinked. And that's why we've got what well, we've got to get this right. But we do work closely with CMS, with the Culture, Media and Sport Department. And that's why we're getting that uh, safer place guidance with them, although they are leading on um, on. Uh, uh, tourism, if you like, which will include hotels, uh, we will feed into that and we'll make sure that they feed into our hospitality piece of work because they are so, so interconnected. Question here from Alex, and he's using a phrase which I have to say I, I, I don't recognise. So forgive me, everybody, if I'm being dim. Paul, I've given you the perfect explanation to say you don't understand it either if you've never heard it. But I'll put the question to you uh, and then you can say whether you understand. If you do understand it, maybe you could unpack it a little bit because I suspect I'm not the first person not to have heard this phrase before. So here goes. There's been a lot of discussion in relation to, and here's the phrase, space furlough, which has been successfully implemented in Denmark. What is the current position on this and when will the government provide its view on this? I have heard the phrase, Martin. So space it's me being space. stupid. OK, hands up. So <laughs> thanks of me no. and others that have never heard it. Can you? No, to be fair, to be fair, it's because the reason that I've heard it is because it's been raised a number of times on it, um, on on, re on my retail calls that I have weekly um, and the hospitality calls that I have weekly. And it's a and it, it, it's a fair point that's that's very much worth consideration. And we are looking at it and seeing what we what we need to do. So essentially, we've talked about the furloughing of jobs to to um, almost, uh, you know, to 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 put our arms around jobs to make sure that they don't be redundant. And clearly rent is the big thing for uh, a number of businesses. It's that fixed cost that they all have. They're all locked into uh, um, into those contracts. And so what we did, we we, we said nobody will be uh, able to be evicted from their uh, from their properties as a result of not being able to pay the rent at, the, at this particular period of time. What we then found was uh, some landlords were moving towards the next um, set of aggressive rent recovery that was putting in statutory demands um, to say that they to to prove in inverted commas that companies couldn't then pay their bills. What they then did from their statutory demands that go that goes to in front of a judge later on. To in, a, in the form of a winding up petition, which basically says, look, there's the statute demand that's proved that they can't um, uh, pay the bills. Now you need to, the judge needs to wind them up and I can get my money as a creditor. Now, clearly that's not what we want to happen at all. And so first of all, what we're doing is we, we are um, uh, banning all statutory uh, applications for statutory demands and winding up petitions uh, until the end of June or until the, um, I'm actually going to be legislating on this next Wednesday, so a week today. Um, so it'll either be the end of June or a month after that bit of law comes into uh, in, into commencement. Um, but the idea of space furlough is to say, can can the government pick, effectively pick up a percentage of the tab in the same way that we're pick, picking up the salaries um, for, for, the, for the rent bills as well? Um, and that's something that we need to you know, work through. We, we, we've heard it. The Chancellor will be looking at that in the round with all of the other support things, because clearly what we've got to be doing with any support is we've got to make sure that, yes, we want to protect businesses. Yes, we want to uh, uh, protect jobs, but we've got to make sure that we can do it um, with, within the, uh, uh, the, 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 the circle of having such a lot of money going out from uh, UK PLC at a time. Uh, when we've got a lot of other things to be funding as well. So we really want to be protecting businesses as best we can, which is why the Chancellor is reaching out as much. But we, we just need to look at it in the round. OK, thank you for the answer and thank you for the explanation. This is one from Chris. Is the government going to extend tax free shopping to EU visitors when the transition period ends? They are already 70 percent of our international visitors and will be even more important after COVID-19. This would be a huge boost to our recovery. Martin, I can't give you an answer for that, but I can absolutely see the, uh, the you know, why you, why you, um, businesses in the West End would be asking for that. So I'll definitely take that away and raise that as an issue. 
OK, uh, someone who's remaining anonymous in the face of levelling up. What is the minister doing to ensure that London gets the financial support it needs to drive the country's economy? As you say, the, London is the powerhouse of the UK economy, clearly. Um, if you look at the, the city of, um, uh, of London and, and uh, Canary Wharf, the financial services that we have there, financial services, I think from memory, pay something like 11% of the entire tax stake of the country. Now, clearly not all financial services are just in London, places like Edinburgh as well, but they, they, they dominate. Um, and we know, we've, I've had discussions with Nikki Aitken about the, um, about the um, flagship stores, the retail stores in London and how that drives uh, the thinking, the economies of those big, um, big brands uh, in other parts of the country as well. So um, in terms of their branding, their marketing and, 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 and how they impact the rest of the country. So yes, we will continue to level up around the country. It's, it, our manifesto said that we want the Br Great Britain to be the best place in the world to start a business, to grow a business. And frankly, my job as small business minister, I don't care where you are in the country, it should still be consistent that you can do that. However, um, London, that powerhouse that I was talking about, uh, it's important that we recognise that London does drive that economic growth around the country as well. When I went to see uh, Battersea Power Station uh, before we uh, went into lockdown, um, you know, I was really pleased to see the bricks coming from Gloucestershire, the uh, steel coming from Liverpool being painted in, 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 in um, other parts of the Midlands and, and bits coming from right the way around the country, creating jobs and opportunities around the country to come up with that amazing mixed uh, use re um, uh, regeneration in, in, in the heart of London. So we've got, we, you can't look at any of this in isolation. But so, you know, it's, this isn't North versus South. This isn't London versus the rest of the country. We've got to make sure that, yes, we have the finances within London to do that, that economic generation, but also remembering the fact that if you look at, for me as a um, MP on the uh, um, Southern Railway line, when all of that was kicking off a couple of years ago, Southern and Thameslink, that one rail franchise that covers London and the home counties, takes 22% of all rail passengers across the country. That's how many people are moving in and out of London and reliant on London at any one given time. So it's important that we have the fire that's to be able to service them. I think we were having a little bit of sound problems there, but um, uh, we'll, we'll press on. I think it was just a, a temporary internet connection problem. A question from D here. Can you um, tell us, um, will stores be able to do click and collect before the 15th if their stores are currently closed? If they are, uh, good question. Can't give you surety, but um, at the moment, not sure that that's the case because if you if you look at some of the um, stores for click and collect um because the, because they're out, i don't want to give you the wrong answer i don't think they can actually open the doors at the moment. that might be difficult but clearly they online where a lot of retailers move to um doing click and collect but not from their own store. i'll give you tougher tougher advice Well, thank you for that. Uh, I'm not sure if it's my end or whether everyone's suffering from sound problems. I'll assume that it's just my end and we'll press on and hopefully um, uh, continue to, to make things work. Uh, there's a question here from Rachel. The West End thrives on attracting visitors who enjoy both the retail and the uh, general offering, uh, which is in a very urban area. Most units are not designed to allow for social distancing measures. We know that restaurants will be open after retail and hopefully there will be some valuable lessons to learn from an operations perspective. However, is there a position from the government, even temporary, on opening up public spaces is to allow for extra outdoor seating which would allow restaurants to open up properly and also make consumers feel more comfortable I mean, this is a question Paul which has come up on a, a number of occasions and I think it it, it clearly is, is is a way uh, through some of the the challenges that the restaurants are, are, are facing do you have any thoughts on that yeah it's definitely something that's come up it's something that uh, I think the um, uh, in terms of regulations from central government 
uh, we'd be keen to look at and see if we can make it work. Clearly, that will then need to um, work hand in hand with uh, Westminster Council uh, and the other councils that are around uh, the outskirts of the West End of Camden and, the, and the, those sort of people for the various high streets around central London. Um, because it, it, you know, for the for the economics that I was talking about earlier, if you're two metres away, the fact that you can only open up to a third of capacity makes it really difficult for restaurants and pubs and the rest to to, to operate. Um, there are other things that you know I think we can all work on together, not just from government, but it might be initiatives like um, you know bringing the high street to you. It might be using our um, open spaces in, in in various ways to actually showcase some of the, it won't be day-to-day -day stuff but it might showcase some of those restaurants as they come back on stream in liverpool for example they are um, looking at an initiative called uh, liverpool without walls which is that exactly as you describe it's using um, a bit of weatherproofing that's been um, worked from the council um, but to actually allow restaurants and pubs to spill a little bit more outside um, to 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 be able to open a, a bigger capacity. OK, uh, there's a question here. I'm not sure whether we've covered it already, so forgive me if you have covered it, but I think it's a, a subtly different question to what we've discussed before. The, the questioner is anonymous, but it's um, what is the government's policy on the landlord's right to lease forfeiture, which is currently suspended until the 30th of June? So to the uh, lease forfeiture, which they are saying is currently suspended until the 30th of June. Yeah, so um, the in terms of the lease forfeiture, I'll have to find out for you. I'll have to find out where we go beyond 30th of June, frankly. In, in that, I'm not sure we've taken a decision on that. OK. Um, question here from Chris. Many retailers are reliant on day-to-day -day sales to achieve uh, the London workforce. Has there been any research conducted into what percentage of the workforce will be returning to offices versus flexible home working? I've not seen any uh, uh, um, any detailed um, studies on that at the moment. I think this is something that we're trying to work through with um, the variety of businesses and that's why um, uh, that that's why this workplace guidance is 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 so important because I went before I was elected I I I've been used to working from home when I was running small businesses I launched enough businesses around my kitchen table but uh, but for just my own um, government department base it's like a ghost town at the moment and we're all on Microsoft Teams looking at each other's back walls and bookshelves but uh, uh, but but that does mean that various local high streets but various independent stores in particular who are reliant on that that office trade um won't necessarily have that uh, that ready market day one so um so we will have to adapt so it will be interesting to see how many people are coming back but i think frankly that will be about the confidence piece that i was talking about right at the beginning the more people if they can't work from home and as i say that is going to be the flexible working and the fact that more people are finding that they can work from home means that people won't feel the need to return and, 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 they, and that won't disturb the economy. Our first key thing is getting the economy up and running, but giving the support to those businesses that are going to struggle um, to help them adapt, whether that's from a business model point of view or whether that's whatever support they, they need. We need to look at that in the, in the round. Another question here from anonymous questioner. Um, Westminster will receive only 250,000 of the 51 million government grants to help the borough get back on track. Is that enough? Well, we need to work with Westminster to find out exactly what it is they need. I mean, I think one thing that uh, for for councils is that they are uh, going to have to. We're going to have to have some really difficult conversations. If you look at how councils worked in in terms of um, um, after the 2008 financial crash, uh, a lot of local authorities up and down the country have been used to doing business in one way. They um, they then um, had to readjust over and it took them a long time. Um, so it means I think they're used to the, the, the getting ready for the com conversation that's going to come in, in terms of how councils can resource themselves um, it, it, with with diminishing financial support. But in terms of the money that's coming back to uh, support businesses, 
um, the discretionary fund that we launched, the £619 million discretionary fund to allow grants uh, to go out across the country for businesses that fall in between the cracks. This is something we're making sure that we can uh, uh, look at how we're spending uh, the grant money that's been all allocated at the moment. And we, we need to just work through that um, because it's been extraordinary that there's still £2 billion around the country uh, not necessarily in London for any number of reasons that makes London a particular issue, um, but businesses in, in the hospitality, retail and leisure sector that may be entitled to um, uh, grants have just haven't claimed them. And so that means uh, and we're doing enormous amount of work to make make them aware of what they can and can't claim. Local authorities are working really hard on that as well. Um, so we, we are phoning up local authorities. We're put, doing a lot, lot of media. Um, to attract um, that that uh, that attention. So, uh, but but in terms of the the grant money, if it's not going to those businesses, we want to make sure the fact that it is there. We need to give it to businesses when they need it, when the cash flow is is so tight. We've got a, a few more minutes left. Uh, time for a few more questions, but uh, one here from Lee, an interesting one. What's your view on the reintroduction of the congestion charge and the increase? at a time when people are trying to avoid public transport? Well, I think the reintroduction of the congestion charge was something that was considered necessary uh, by both the government and TfL because of the, um, at, at its present level, at its, you know, its previous level, um, because as people were going back to um, uh, their cars, uh, then it, it just helps regulate the flow because otherwise you're snarling up again that part of town. But the, what the government did, it talked about to, to um, Transport for London as it was um, seeking bailout, uh, the fact that it did need to look at its revenue in the, in, in the medium term. And so asked them to bring back uh, proposals how to widen that scope. Now, um, that proposals is really difficult, different from imposition. So to increase the charge overnight without any discussion, any debate wasn't great um, by so much. But actually, even on top of that, when we've been talking about hospitality, to extend the hours into the evening and over the weekend, I think is, um, is, is an error because it's just going to cause extra pressure for those businesses. Um, first of all, for people that might want to um, delay their deliveries uh, and they're driving through uh, to stagger the journeys that I was talking about before. But for restaurants, for um, uh, pubs and what have you, as they gradually start to open, for people that will drive in, park up after the after the parking hours and, and these kind of things and then use the facilities that that's not going exactly going to motivate them to come out and, and spend their money. So I'm not sure that was the best move. OK, question here again, an anonymous questioner. Uh, the date for rough sleepers to be exited from lockdown accommodation uh, is from the 3rd of July. What is the minister doing to ensure that London does not allow numbers to go back to those pre lockdown? So I'm working up uh, on some programs to see what we can do in terms of, um, uh, well, two things. I mean, the, the, the Secretary of State has talked about for uh, uh, communities, local government has talked about providing homes for those people um, in the medium to long term. But clearly there's going to be a, a time when, uh, as you say, we don't want them to go back onto the streets. So I'm trying to work up some uh, with stakeholders, with, uh, with, with partners across London, a way of actually using space um, better uh, to make sure that we can have a, uh, that we can house them, but we can also give them the support they need because there's no point in just sort of having someone coming in and putting a roof over their head one day and then uh, uh, returning to the street at any hard edge or, or hard end to any support program. So a lot of rough sleepers, if you're going to tackle um, the underlying issue, it's employment support, it's mental health support, it's all of these kind of things that needs to be provided close to where they're, where they're situated. So the more that we can do in, in one area um, to give them that all round support, the, the, the easier it is going to avoid them just returning to the streets once the amazing support that many hotels and other uh, businesses have given. Um, in terms of um, uh, taking them off the street and offering them, offering them shelter comes to an end. OK, question here. Um, what is the cycling strategy for the West End? Will key commuter stations have more bikes available to hire and more bike parks? 
Well, that's something we we'll be needed to address to Transport for London, and it's it's a it's a really pertinent question because, as I say, if you you know if you, the fact that you've got congestion uh, the charge back on, you're trying to keep people away from uh, public transport where, wherever possible uh, to enable others that that are needing to do those journeys to socially distance. It absolutely makes sense to uh, to make sure that we've got better parking on the outskirts of London, that we've got more car, um, cycles um, uh, capacity both in terms of cycle uh, uh, parking, but also cycle lanes and cycle support as uh, uh, dedicated um, areas that people can cycle in. But that's something that is being worked up at the moment, as I say. OK, time for one last question. This is the last question. We've heard about partial furlough coming in the future. However, nothing from now until August, knowing that shift work in retail means we could benefit a lot by having people on, for example, 80 percent. Is this something that may be accelerated? Well, it's something that has been has come up. Uh, a number of people have requested it. I think um, what we've got to make sure we do, as, as I say right at the beginning with a lot of these schemes, when you're delivering something at such scale, at such speed, we've got to make sure that um, uh, the pro process is robust enough um, and uh, not too resource intensive. So that is being worked through. That's something that, as I say, people have um, raised with the Chancellor. He is considering it, whether it's deliverable or not. I can't tell you at this stage. Paul, it's been a pleasure speaking to you and thank you for answering all of those questions in such detail. And thank you to you for putting your questions to the Minister. Uh, next week, we'll be hearing from Anne Pitcher, who is the Managing Director at Selfridges Group. She'll be telling us how the luxury department store adapted to lockdown, its plans for reopening and the changes that customers will see. That is at uh, 4 p.m next Wednesday, the 3rd of June. For now, thank you for joining us. Goodbye and keep safe.